so welcome to the first episode of this exciting and timely new webinar series, The Good and the Bad of Black Grad with Dr. Evelyn Asiadu. In this inaugural episode, Dr. Asiadu and three colleagues will explore the topic of being the only one. My name is Ian Worley and I'm the executive director of KEGS. Je m'appelle Ian Worley et je suis le directeur exécutif de l'AS. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and some housekeeping announcements. Je voudrais commencer par quelques annonces concernant la technologie et une reconnaissance du territoire. We are delighted to provide interpretation for this event and we are hoping that it will work. Uh, there is a link in the chat. Uh, there have been some technical issues this morning with that, but if it does work, that would be great. This webinar series is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Ashinaabe territory. KEGS honors all First Nations, Inuit, Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land from coast to coast to coast and everywhere in between. Next, we highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right hand side of the window. We kindly request that you keep yourself muted during the session unless asking a verbal question. Please feel free to use the chat menu to converse with your colleagues throughout the webinar. Without any further ado, I would now like to introduce the executive producer and host of this series. In July 2020, Evelyn Asiadu published an article in Maclean's titled Canadian Universities Must Collect Race-Based Data, which spoke to her experience as a Black female graduate student. Having ignored the feelings of rejection and isolation for her entire academic career, this op-ed was the first time that she openly described her solitary journey as a Black female scientist. Following its publication, she received several emails from others with similar experiences from across Canada, including some from students who were struggling with racism and seeking advice. The piece had struck a nerve. Building on the current momentum behind the Black Lives Matter movement, Evelyn was inspired to create The Good and the Bad of Black Grad, a webinar series designed with and for Black students. Evelyn Asiadu is a native of Brampton, Ontario. She received her honors Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Western University in 2013, and later that year moved to Edmonton to commence a PhD program at the University of Alberta. Her thesis work aimed to identify chemicals in oil sands wastewater and to understand how long those chemicals take to degrade. Her volunteer activities have centered around environmental sustainability, community building, and the promotion of diversity in science. Her writing on the latter topic has been published in Medium and the Chemical Institute of Canada. KEGS is delighted to offer this series and we are delighted to have Evelyn as the producer and, co and host and we look forward to the conversations that will come out of this, uh, this webinar and future webinars. I now turn the microphone over to you, Dr. Asidu. Thanks, Ian. Wow, what a long introduction. <laughs> I appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited for our inaugural episode of The Good and the Bad of the Black Grad. So as Ian mentioned, the events of 2020 have uh, been key in why I started this webinar series. So over the last several months, uh, systemic racism has been shown to be pre prevalent across the world and uh, the post-secondary universities, post-secondary institutions, excuse me, are not exempt. Um, specifically in Canada, there is an absence of race-based data collection and this has empowered the Canadian Acad Academy to deny its own racism without consequence. So this is part of the reason why we're having this conversation. At this moment, institutions are poised to assess their anti-racism strategies as the infrastructure of collection of qualitative and quantitative data is being established. So. The aim of this series is to create a space for uh, Black academics to share their stories. And we hope, I hope, the webinar will provide a platform which will amplify the voices which are scattered across the country, as well as this inspire Canadian universities and anybody interested in equity to, to do more in their communities. So we're just going to begin with a disclaimer. Uh, the conversations here are going to be very real, they're going to be authentic, and uh, they're going to be coming from the hearts and minds of the panelists. So. Uh, the thoughts and, express, uh, thoughts and opinions expressed here are meant to be shared uh, to give an idea of what it is to be a Black academic in Canada. We welcome all questions, including those that may have perhaps uh, complicated answers, but we will not tolerate anything that is harmful um, and, and we will not tolerate hate speech in this, in this room. So anyone espousing such opinions or beliefs will be removed from the room. Okay, so I think that's enough introductions. Let's 
get started. I'm here with three lovely colleagues, and the first of which is Kayon Christie. She's a PhD student or soon to be PhD student at the University of Michigan Ann Armour and is currently reporting from Brampton, Ontario. Hey, Christy. Oh, sorry, Christy. Oh my God, Kayon. Mm, see? This is what happens. <laughs> Next, we have Tiffany Gordon. She is a PhD student from Dalha Dalhousie University and is reporting from Halifax. Hi, Tiffany. How are you doing today? Hi, Eve. I'm good, thanks. Excited awesome. to get to the discussion. Yes, we'll get there quite soon. Also, we have Melanie Morrison, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, San Francisco, and is with us here from Los Angeles. Melanie, how's it doing? Hello. Thanks for doing this, Eve. <laughs> of course, of course. We're going to get right into the questions here. And I'll just draw the audience members to the poll, the first poll question. Um, so we'll start with Kayon. If you had to describe grad school in one word, grad school is a roller coaster ride. A roller coaster. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kayon. Uh, Tiffany, what's your response? What do you think about grad school? I have to agree. It's a roller coaster. All right. Melanie? I'm going to say it's freeing. Freeing. Okay. I like that. Uh, do we have the response to the poll question, Ian? Just wondering what our audience members think about grad school. Our options were freeing, fun, stressful, and a roller coaster. And I don't know how we see these results. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ev. Uh, the poll just started. It's only been on for 20 seconds. Oh, uh, I see. Poll, and we have, uh, but we have 72% voted already. So just give it okay. a, another minute and I'll uh, produce the results. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Roller coaster is accurate, I think. I mean, not to, to sway anybody's answer, <laughs> um, but all of these I think apply. So I'm interested to see what, what everyone says. I personally having just finished grad school, have stressful kind of really at the, at the front of my, my mind here, but um, it, is, it is a lot of things and can evoke a lot of emotions in graduate students. So let's see what our, our audience members are gonna say here. A roller coaster, okay. Well, that's good to know. Roller coaster, yeah, that is, that is fairly, fairly accurate. Because I think that the roller coaster captures it being fun and it being stressful with the highs and lows. So perhaps totally. the resonance is coming in. Definitely. I, I, I agree. Thanks. Thanks, Kayon. Thanks to everybody who participated. Um, and so just going around uh, quickly, starting with Melanie this time, can you give us an elevator pitch about your research? What do you do? Sure. So I am a neuroimaging scientist. Um, it means I spend a lot of time, uh, my time working with magnetic resonance imaging machines. And I'm interested in collecting rich information about the brain. So information about brain function or brain pathology, brain structure, and using that information to study the natural history of neurological diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or brain tumors, and also using that information to improve the therapies that are used to treat those neurological diseases. And I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yes. Brainy, brainy research. Kay uh, what did you do and what will you be doing as you transition into your PhD? Yeah, um, so I consider myself to be a Black, Caribbean, transnational, uh, feminist, medical sociologist, um, which is a mouthful. But for me, um, my research program is really concerned with addressing the social and structural factors that shape Black people's health across the diaspora. So my master's research looked at um, black, pregnant Black women's experiences of medical racism in Canada and Jamaica. And I'm not quite sure what I'll be doing for my PhD, but it will somehow fit into that larger research program. Super interesting and kind of topical, right? Related to, to maybe what a lot of conversations have been focused on specifically during the, the pandemic. So very cool research. Tiffany, give us your elevator pitch. What do you do? <laughs> sure, so my areas of study are social and political thought, philosophy of race and feminist philosophy. So my research interests all kind of go into those different areas. But for my dissertation, I'm looking at the over-incarceration of Black and Indigenous people in North America. And I'm really interested in theories of punishment and abolition as well. So how do we justify incarceration? Um, so that's what my dissertation is looking into. And also how do we hold society collectively responsible for the conditions that lead to over-incarceration? So my dissertation has those kind of, those two elements in it. And I'm in the process of writing my proposal, so I haven't defended yet, 
but hopefully that will happen soon. It will happen. It has to happen, right? You're going to make it happen. So thanks for that. Yes, thanks for that uh, elevator pitch. You guys are all doing very, very interesting research. And um, that's a huge part of what grad school is. It's it's research. And um, this segment of, of the conversation will be focused on on the good, as the, as the name is uh, implies. We'll talk about the good and the bad of, of graduate school, specifically for Black graduate students. And so, Tiffany, if I can start with you, um, why did you choose to do grad school. Um, yeah, let's hear, let's hear your story a bit. Sure, so actually I, I chose philosophy just because I wanted to learn more about it and I love philosophy. So uh, philosophy isn't the most practical of disciplines, right? You don't think, oh, I'm gonna do a PhD in philosophy and get a job. So you actually have to love it. And um, in my undergrad, I did political science and philosophy with a focus on poli sci. And I thought, you know, I really like this philosophy thing, but I'm not really sure. So let me do my master's and see if I can find the things that I'm passionate about, which is racism and sexism. If I can research that stuff long term, I did my master's. I was like, okay, I could do some of this stuff. I did it on racial profiling. And then I just decided to, to apply for my PhD. So it was really just because I really love learning and I love philosophy. Um, and I thought, you know, teaching suits me. And if I can become a professor, that would be really great. <laughs> so there wasn't any grand scheme besides a love for the field. Yeah, no, and I can feel your passion about about what you do and kind of how that's led you to where you are, um, which I think sometimes is is how people end up in, in grad school. Um, I'm interested to hear, um, can, 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 yes, <laughs> grad right. school. Why did you choose, choose it and and how's, how's it going so far? Yeah, um, so I initially didn't plan to pursue graduate education. Um, when I started my undergrad at McMaster, I had dreams and hopes of becoming a medical doctor because um, I really wanted to address some of the health inequities, uh, racial health inequities specifically that I was witnessing um, in Canada and abroad. Um, but I ended up getting a research job after I finished my first undergrad. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with research after that. And I got a few other research jobs and I'm like, yes, I could totally see myself doing this for the rest of my life. I remember like thinking when I got my first research job, like I was scamming them. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I, like I love reading and writing and, 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 and thinking. And I'm like, they're paying me for this. I would literally do all this for free, but I will take the money. Um, <laughs> so I was like, if I could continue on this trajectory, um, in as a career path, that would be exceptional. So I decided to, um, do grad school and I, um, I've been, as I said, it's been a roller coaster ride. I think one of my favorite parts of grad school though, is the intellectual work. Like I love thinking with really smart people about things that I'm interested in. I love collaborating on research projects. I love talking to like my peers and my colleagues and my friends about some of the ideas that I'm thinking about. I remember in my, um, when I was doing data analysis for my master's project, um, the, the, it was very messy. Like if anyone who's done qualitative data analysis knows that it's a very messy process, but it was that messy process that I found to be so fulfilling and so generative and so um, like even pleasurable just talking through these ideas with people. So I, I absolutely love that about grad school. Um, and I will, I'll end there. Thanks, Kayon. Yeah, I, it, you really do uh, to some degree have to, to have that passion and that drive for asking specific questions and reading, definitely reading, lots of reading. And so it sounds like you're in the right place. So that's great. Uh, Melanie, you are now at the end of your, your PDF, your postdoctoral fellowship. So you've been, you've been doing grad school for a long time or the, the something related to, to such things. And so how, how did you fall into this and, and uh, yeah, how's it going? Yeah. So, um, so I did my undergrad at Carleton University. I actually started in biology and uh, kind of like Cam mentioned, I wanted to be a medical doctor and I was sort of all over the place in my undergrad um, and quite late in the game, discovered the field of medical physics, which involves medical imaging. And while I was um, overseas, I did an international exchange in my third year at um, the University of Leeds. And in that time, I was sort of exploring like what I wanted to do and came across back in Toronto, um, the medical biophysics department. Um, and they were offering a summer research program. So I actually ended my um, international exchange early so that I can get back in time to Toronto for the summer research program. And um, that experience, so I was working at Princess Market Hospital and I was doing cancer related imaging research. And it was just a, it was a fantastic experience. And I really fell in love with research in that moment. And so I ended up applying to the same department's graduate program um, for a master's. 
and that was the only school I applied to. And so I was very fortunate that I got in. And um, in that during that time, I actually reclassified after 18 months to a PhD. So I didn't uh, have to actually do the master's um, and then ended up finishing with a PhD. So everything kind of uh, definitely went in a direction that I wasn't planning. Um, but I'm, of course, uh, grateful for the opportunity and the experiences that I've had. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't necessarily always have the full picture of how to get to where you are now, but I mean, that's absolutely fine. And, and uh, I think that that's a good part of our stories that we need to tell. Um, question related to why grad school is great. Um, we'll start with you, Melanie. What, what do you think, or how do you think your research is making our society better? It's just a small question, just like an easy question for you. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I work in healthcare research, so I'm a clinic, I work in clinical imaging and predominantly with, with human uh, imaging data. So um, my contributions in, with my research uh, to society sort of come by way of making, uh, filling in knowledge gaps and, and trying to build technology to improve healthcare. So I answer the types of questions like, why does this therapy work for one patient, but not the other patient? Or why does this therapy like radiation lead to long-term cognitive impairments in certain patients? And I'm using imaging data to um, answer those questions. Um, what, I, what I do like is there's a really nice translational component I tend to love working with neurosurgeons. And so in my PhD and my postdoc, I've been just overly attracted to the work that is done by neurosurgeons and neurosurgical therapies. So I'll give an example. Um, when, I was, when, when I was doing my uh, PhD, um, the imaging data I would collect on patients to look at brain function, I would then was able to take into the operating room and use it to help the surgeon plan brain tumor surgeries. And, and just last week, um, I, I sent imaging data to one of the surgeons and said, can you just let me know uh, how this works out for your case tomorrow? So that's the kind of like working environment. And there's really that nice translational component and it really feels like you're making a, a contribution. So that's what I really love about what I do. That's wonderful. Yeah, thanks, thanks Mel, that's huge. Um, we'll, we'll skip over to Tiffany. How are we, how, are, how is Tiffany changing the world through research? Well, I mean, I don't know about changing the world, but I you are changing that. the world. You are changing the world, <laughs> girl. Well, I, I think that because of what I'm able to learn being in a PhD program means that you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of critical thinking, especially in philosophy. I have a lot of knowledge about racism and and just you know conceptions of race and where it comes from and and incarceration. I just have a lot of things that I've learned over the years, and I think that that knowledge is really important, especially in a time like this where we need that type of information. Um, and also philosophers are great critical thinkers, right? I, I don't consider myself to always think with the crowd. I ask questions that sometimes are uncomfortable, but that's part of how I've been trained to think uh, as a philosopher or as a philosophy major. So yes, I think critical thinking and just having a broad range of knowledge on really important topics, I think that's, that's what I contribute, um, so yes. Yeah, no, and I think that that's huge, the ability to think specifically and deeply about, about complicated things. So yeah, hats off to you and to, to all the philosophers out there. Yeah, that's, that was my, my shout out to you. Um, we'll now go over to, to Kayon. Uh, how do you feel that your research has been contributing to society or improving society and changing the world? Yeah, um, before I respond, I'll just say that Tiffany philosophy, Tiffany, someone said in the chat that Tiffany is changing the world, and I agree, so I just want to make that. Um, <laughs> and that in my own work, like, I've benefited so much from um, philosophers and, and different philosophical contributions, so I'm grateful for the discipline in, in many ways as well. Um, so for me as a sociologist, um, well, sociology is the study of society, so the hope is that whatever research that sociologists do contribute in some way um, to the betterment of society. But we know that that hasn't always been the case and that isn't always the case. Um, but for me, um, because my research program is concerned with the structural determinants of health and how like systems of inequality intersect to shape our everyday life and, and then also health, um, I see my research helping in that way. So oftentimes I think um, doctors or like primary healthcare providers are responding to like immediate needs. But I think my role as a sociologist is to look more at the upstream factors and really interrogate how those upstream factors are shaping people's health and then provide solutions 
um, and um, solutions and ways that we can address those upstream factors. And that really starts by looking at these larger systems of inequality, like racism and sexism and patriarchy and how those things are, are influencing people's lives. So I think that the work um, that sociologists do and certainly my work, I think is contributing to helping society, especially society be better through understanding things that impact people's health better. Yeah, no, definitely. It sounds like like through your work, you're you're reviewing and investigating a lot of invisible factors that influence us in our in our day to day lives. And I like the I like the phrase that you use downstream effects that that have impacts on on our health. So thank you all. Thank you all for all the work that you do and, and for the work that you will be will be contributing to, to the academy um, in your years moving forward. Um, last segment, last question of this segment with respect to to why we love grad school. Um, we'll start with you, uh, Kayon. What is the thing to date that you are most proud of related to your work? And um, if you need some time to think, we can, we can, you can point your finger at somebody else. <laughs> it's below me. Um, I can, I can go. I like when I read this question, I was like, hmm, this is hard. Um, there, you know, I think academia just like pushes you to like not really celebrate your successes. Um, as much as you probably should. Um, but in thinking about what I, I am most proud of to date, I think it would be completing my master's thesis. Um, and, hey. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's was, like the first body of research that I did from start to finish on my own. Um, certainly people were helping me along the way. So obviously it wasn't my, my own, but something that I thought of and I conducted and I wrote up um, by myself. And then also how it was received after. So I had written a, a public facing article about my master's work in an Afrocentric magazine called Trad oh. Magazine. And the reception that I got from that piece was really positive. And so it meant a lot for me that my work that I was doing in the academy was transferable and relatable and resonated with people in the community. And I think that for me, that's really important as a scholar that whatever I'm doing in the ivory tower is relevant to my community to black people to black women so that meant a lot and i think that's probably what i'm most proud of um, at this point congratulations that's that's huge yeah. Could, would you mind just um giving us a, a short summary of what that article uh talked about yeah so um again i was looking at black women pregnant black women's experiences of medical racism in canada and jamaica um and what i developed like, through those interviews and through analyzing the transcripts, I developed this concept of colorblind healthcare, which speaks to the ways that um, racism is reproduced by ignoring race. When healthcare providers ignore race, how that negatively impacts Black women's experiences of care in various ways. Um, and I'd be happy to post the link uh, maybe after this or send you a link to, to um, send out Definitely. to people. But um, this idea that not seeing race is harmful and it doesn't help anybody. And that in fact, seeing race and being conscious of how race and racism, particularly racism is a structural determinant of health, um, provides better care for black women and not only black women, but all non-white people. Um, mm -hmm. we, can't continue, we can't continue to see white patients as the norm because they are not uh, the norm. They're just another, another race. So. Right, right. We're all humans and we all deserve uh, to have the best care possible. So that that would be lovely if you could share that with us and we will share it with our audience members. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, going over to Melanie, let's mix up the order. <laughs> what can okay. you say about the thing that you are most proud of or things? So um, I feel like before I probably would have said it would have been earning my PhD um, in 2016. I graduated before 20 of like my best friends and family at a time where we could all be in the same room. So that was awesome. Wow. But more recently, um, I'd probably say my greatest, or my, I guess, proudest moment, um, or is it, what am I most proud of today, <laughs> um, is launching my first independent research study. So um, in 2019, I was feeling pretty lost and confused during my postdoc. So it is definitely a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. um, and in regards to finding my research niche or that or that research area that was unique to, to my own interest and didn't really involve what my, my boss was working on um, in order to stay in academia. And um, I found that in a field called deep brain stimulation, which is a neuromodulation therapy that's used to, it's a surgical therapy that's used to treat uh, disorders like Parkinson's disease or depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. And so, 
Um, in 2019, I, I emailed the first neurosurgeon, cold emailed him at UCSF and, and started um, going into the operating room and going into the clinic and learning more about this therapy and the patient population. And uh, over two years, uh, put together the ethics application and a team of 15 people and uh, launched it uh, this year. And we just scanned the third patient. So I'm definitely proud of that. And though my long-term goal is to yeah. host the faculty position, thank you. Um, if I don't get there, if I, if I, if I, if I don't get there, I'll be happy uh, with this. So congratulations. That's, that's yeah. huge. We'll end with, uh, Tiffany. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on the thing that makes you proud of what you've done so far? I think just, uh, still being here, is <laughs> yeah. making yeah. it my sure. undergrad, my master's <laughs> I'm in the fifth year of my PhD. I've wanted to quit so many times. I'm not just saying the PhD, I'm saying like my undergrad, I, I have a post calls, my master's, you know, it's been really tough to just stay in it. And I'm just happy that I'm still here. Shout out Absolutely. to all the people who talked me off the ledge of quitting when it got <laughs> too stressful. But right now that's what I'm most, you know, proud of. I've done some writing and other side projects, but I think at the end of the day, this is my main thing that I, I really care about. And the fact that I've, I'm still here is something that I consider to be an accomplishment, so. No, that is absolutely an accomplishment and something that that uh, should be spoken about more often, you know, doing grad school, you know, people think, well, grad school is for, for smart people. And I mean, yeah, sure, to some degree it is, but it's, it's a grind. It is a grind. So definitely congratulations um, for for doing the thing. We're still doing it. We're, we're very proud of you. And, and that kind of lends nicely to the to the next segment of, of our discussion, which is the bad. Dun, dun, dun. It's not I mean. It's not going to get that dark. We're just going to talk about some of our challenges and, and what we've been through. So um, as you said, uh, Tiffany, you're talking about, you know, this, this struggle and, and continuously soldiering on throughout the various degrees. And so um, one aspect of graduate school, which I don't know if the general pu uh, public knows about is, is the uh, isolation that can be felt and that is felt by many graduate students, um, but I think that there is an added element for um, graduate students of color, specifically black graduate students. So um, maybe I'll start off with that question. And, and, and if it's okay, I'll start with you, Tiffany. Um, do you think that isolation um, is, is a thing for, for black graduate students? And um, if so, um, maybe you could speak to your experience about how, how you've navigated that or um, yeah, anything really related to that question. Sure, so also Rachel, I see, and uh, some of the comments, I see them as they come up, but I can't acknowledge them, so thank you. <laughs> um, thanks for the support. Yeah, so isolation in grad school, undergrad, um, you know, I'm in philosophy, which is very white dominated, very white male dominated, at least in Canada. In the United States, I feel like the demographics might be slightly different, but I still think that the field is pretty, you know, white dominated. and. You know, as a Black person, I have my own culture, I'm Jamaican, and I have my own things that I do to relax. And that, that might just be different from, you know, my, my white friends in the program, my white, I guess, uh, grad students that, that have, you know, been through the process with. So I think it's difficult because for me, it's a culture thing and I seek out Black people, not because I'm trying to um, make anyone feel like I don't want to be around them, but it's just because I'm more comfortable to de-stress in certain spaces. Um, so that means that I'm kind of doing a double double duty where I am trying to be a part of the community where I am in philosophy, but I'm also involved in other communities. So I don't have as much time all the time to, to be with you know, the rest of the department. So I find that that's a struggle. I do try to balance both, but it sometimes means that I don't show up at certain things for the department because I'm doing other things that to me feed me a right. bit more. Um, so that's a struggle for me, but I have always tried to find a community wherever I am. So I've made that effort and it's been really good. That's awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, Kayon, can you speak to that uh, experience? And um, actually, I hope that you'll mention a project that you started. Um, I'll let you go ahead. <laughs> project. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of isolation, when I had initially read this question, I immediately thought of um, Patricia Hill Collins work. And so Patricia Hill Collins is a Black feminist sociologist. 
and she talks about um, black women experiencing what's called the out, like being the outsider within. So when we are, we leave our communities um, home and we go into the academy, into sociology, that's the discipline she's in, that's the discipline I'm in, we become um, socialized and professionalized into our discipline, right? Um, but we know that these disciplines historically have excluded black people um, and many other different people. So we feel like outsiders, we're still isolated from the discipline community, the academic community. And then in the same way, when we go back home, sometimes we often sometimes feel disconnected from our communities mm -hmm. in many ways because of the fact that we're being socialized in these in these Definitely. institutions and we're receiving this type of professionalization. Um, so we're isolated in many ways in, in that regard. And then also I was thinking about the ways um, in which uh, positivism, so this idea that we should be like objective, neutral observers in our research really underpins um, sociology and perhaps a lot of other disciplines, but certainly in sociology. And so this idea that we should be detached from our work and like isolated from our work, but we know that we were talking about this before that as black people, many of us bring our, our real lives and our, and our experiences into our work so we can't be detached from our work. And so this push, I think, this like really dominant push to be yeah. detached from your work, I think might also be isolating and you have to kind of fight even harder to justify why I know centering myself in my work is important, bringing my lived experiences in my work is important because otherwise the discipline really pushes you to be like a really disembodied scholar and see this, this research that you're doing as separate from your everyday life. But we know that all of these things are, are connected. And so the project that you're referring to Eve um, is a project that, um, I, me and my friend Fallon developed called Grad Schooling While Black. And so we're still in the very early stages of developing it and um, making the organization run um, smoothly. But in the fall, we, let, we had these a four part webinar series to support black people who are considering graduate school. Cause we know that there's so many barriers into figuring out how to apply, where to apply, when to apply, what makes a good application and these things. Um, so what we're trying to do with Grad Schooling While Black is to support Black students to and through um, graduate education in Canada. And so we awesome. covered a bunch of different things in those four part series um, from applying to a master's program and like discussing what master's programs even are and like what, what is research, what is graduate research type thing. We talked about um, some federal scholarships that you can apply for, finding a mentor um, and deciding on a grad program and things like that. So the awesome. hope is that in giving this type of additional mentorship that it can encourage more um, black students or help more black people consider awesome. graduate school as, a, as an option. Thank you, thanks for that, yeah. We'll move on to Melanie. Um, you've been, as I keep mentioning, been in school a long time. <laughs> so, so, so have I, I mean, you're not in school anymore. But um, yeah, did you in your graduate degree feel disconnected or isolated at, at any point? Yeah, so I'll start by saying um, uh, my mom is white and my dad is black, he's from Jamaica. Um, so I, I grew up around white and black people mm -hmm. and have a lot of friends that are white. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say that I feel isolated or uncomfortable around white people, if I'm going to be completely honest, um, mm -hmm. just because they're part of my community growing up. Um, but there were moments, um, I think in graduate school and, uh, even in my postdoc where I kind of noticed my blackness a little more. Um, I feel like people in the black community, unfortunately also, um, often tend to come from educationally or economically disadvantaged backgrounds. And that was very true to my upbringing. Um, we grew up poor for, you know, a lot of my upbringing and that was very difficult. And I think when, um, going to graduate school, I noticed that sort of, I felt a little bit more disconnected from some of my friends who were able to uh, study and then go home and, and do homework. Whereas um, I would wake up and go to school and then I would um, go tutor and then I would go to Kelsey's diner and I would serve tables until 11 PM. And I did that, you know, every week uh, just to get through graduate school and to keep up with everyone. So I think there are a lot of times where I felt very frustrated um, just because of that background, um, though I have loving parents and family members and friends who are always very interested in my research and I appreciate those questions but, um, and, and comments, but it's also nice to have that sort of stimulation at home or within your family and community um, to, to just to be able to have conversations with people about what you're doing. And, um, and so I, I definitely felt a little disconnected from some of my friend groups in graduate school then. Um, and I'll probably stop there. I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure we're, we're going to get into it a bit more. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. And, and, and I hear what you're saying for sure. Like I, um, I'm not biracial. I'll, I'll 
um, as you are, but I do have uh, a lot of deep connections here in, in Edmonton and, and across the country with people who I hold dear to my heart and many of them are white, um, but there is for myself personally, there, there has been instances where I have felt challenged um, because kind of, kind of related to what, what Can had said um, in terms of feeling like you, or I should say I as a scientist should be objective, should be um, able to look at the facts, review them and comment on them without uh, almost imposing who I am. But um, somewhere along the line, you know, I, I, I more and more was reviewing um, how, how am I presented in, in these textbooks? How do people like me um, contribute to, to theories? How do they contribute to, to principles that are being taught to uh, myself and, and students who are coming into, into the education system? And so um, I had written a, an article for uh, CIC magazine uh, not too long ago, which speaks to that experience in terms of um, you know, as a chemist, we learn lots of lots of theories, um, many of which have uh, been named after after um, men, and um, many of them have been named by white men. Um, and these are foundational to to chemistry, and um, they're important. And the more and more I thought about it, I was like, okay, I'm learning about, for example, one process that was developed in the in the twenties, which is important to my research. And um, when this person patented this process, black people weren't uh, allowed to to come into the city of Edmonton, which is where I study. So it's just making that connection between how history has impacted people who look like us and the things that we're doing now. It can be um, challenging for for you know for us, for myself, but I, I imagine it's challenging for for. Um, for non-Black people as well to, to understand why racism is so systemic and why it's still a thing. So um, I don't want to ramble, but I, I, I'm just trying to pull these, these things together. And so I thank you guys for, for sharing those points, uh, those points with me. Um, so Melanie had uh, addressed a question which I had posed to you guys uh, earlier about being aware of your your blackness, and so I think I thank you, Melanie, for for answering that question. I don't know if you had anything to add before I I pose the same question to to Kayon and Tiffany. Um, I will briefly say so. Um, I think now after have, going through these these uh, questions with all of you, um, and then looking back on my graduate experience, which I guess was a few years ago, um, there were moments that kind of made me my stomach turn a little or um, me think twice about com certain conversations that were had and whether or not they were related to my skin color or um, other things. Um, I think it's important to pay attention to those. And I'll give one example. Um, when I was interviewing for graduate school um, at, at the one institution that I applied to and, went and did my studies in, I was asked uh, what my family did uh, during that, that um, interview. And at that, in that moment, I was 22 years old. So um, I, it made me feel a little weird, but I, not, you know, I, I wasn't brave enough to speak up and, and ask why I was asked that question. And it actually made me feel very uncomfortable. And so I think, um, yeah, I'm not really sure where that's going with noticing my blackness or that question, but I think looking back and thinking on those moments and, and those conversations and, I kind of wish I would have paid a little more attention um, or had you know brought the, those experiences up to the department. Definitely. And, and uh, I don't think that it is disconnected. I think that does address the question because perhaps why you were uncomfortable, why I might've been uncomfortable because it maybe feels like coded language. Like what does what my parents do have anything to do with what I can do here in this graduate program? And that is... Uh, an association, as we know, there are there are strong ties to classism and racism, and so maybe in that moment your stomach your stomach was doing something weird. You couldn't put your finger on it, but those are the split second uh, instances that do happen frequently in in uh, in the lives of of people of color and Black people in 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 academia. So I, I appreciate that example, Melanie. Um, Tiffany, uh, any moments for you in the last several years that have stuck out in your mind? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I mentioned earlier that my discipline is majority white. I don't say that to erase all the amazing black philosophers. No, and philosophers 
color that are out there. I know you all, I, re I read you all, you all are brilliant. My supervisor, Dr. Chike, Chike Jeffers is a black philosopher and he's amazing. So I'm not trying to say that to erase the people who do exist, but pretty much every time I walk into a room of philosophers, I'm made aware of my blackness because um, usually I'm one, the only one or one of a few. Um, at Dalhousie, it's different because my supervisor is also black. Uh, but I was thinking about this question and back to my undergrad, a couple of experiences that I had that made me feel like I was very different. I had a, one professor, it was a philosophy of science class. After I took a, a test and got like an A plus on it, he took me aside and he said, you know, you know, you got it like a 90 something on this exam. And I, I was like, yeah, I know. I got my grade. I studied, right? It was just, it was just strange that he would pull me aside above everyone else in the class and point that out to me, right? And it's like, well, I expect that if I study really hard and I didn't sleep for three days, <laughs> that I would get a good grade, right? And another that happened another time in a different class too, where the TA actually told everyone that I got an A plus on my assignment and he walked it over to me. And it was so strange because I thought, when white guys <laughs> get A's on their assignments, like does everyone have to know? Do you make announcements about this? So I think, those are two instances that I can remember. And I'm sure if I go back to my undergrad days, I know we're talking about grad school, but those are the two that, that stood out that made me think like, really, these people really do think I'm different or an anomaly, or they're trying to figure out if I've cheated. <laughs> so I don't know what it is, but um, those, those are just two examples. In grad school, it's just, I look different, you know, and right. I can't get away from that. Right, no, definitely. Yeah, no, um, um, those instances of uh, double think, they, they consume us sometimes. You're like, is this somebody who's praising me because I did a great job? Or is this somebody who's praising me because they don't expect that I can do as well as I have done? So so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Kayon, any thoughts? Yeah, um, when I was thinking about this question, um, I think what you had mentioned, Eve, about remembering the ways in which history shapes our current moment is really important, right? So we know that like academia has historically, especially in the West rather in the rest, has been historically reserved for like upper class elite white men, right? Most other people were excluded from these, from accessing institutions of higher education. And so I think that the culture, the way that the institutions work are really still um, representative of that, despite the fact that more people and more different types of people are coming into um, academic spaces. So I remember when I first recognized or not that I first recognized my race, but I became very acutely aware of my race and mm -hmm. um, the impact of my race was when I started with master in my undergrad. Because um, I was born in Regent Park, which is a predominantly black and brown neighborhood. Um, I spent most of my years in Brampton, predominantly black and brown. And then so going to McMaster was the first time where I was around so many white people. And I'm just, I felt like a very big culture shock. Like I wasn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know how to, how <laughs> yeah, to I don't know how to act. Like, was like, this was, <laughs> yeah, little, no, that's a little different. Um, <laughs> and so that was when I'm like, okay, I realized that I'm like, I realized what it like that me being black means that I'm different from other people in some ways. I became like, I began to really start developing my critical consciousness. But now as I, um, go higher up in education I'm realizing that like I'm made aware that I'm black because not only that I look different but like the way that you know I think black people see the world the questions that we ask the types of methods we want to use the type of analysis we bring to our work also makes us realize that we're different than mm -hmm. um, the dominant culture and then also some of just like and I think Tiffany was getting at this idea some of the like cultural norms in the discipline like wine and cheese events and uh mm. like all these things are very upper class like things mm. that I'm not used to right I remember going to my first wine and cheese event in my undergrad and feeling disembodied like it was a very disembodied experience I'm like <laughs> what am I doing here like, I'm kind of like sure. looking above myself at it yeah. I feel like I don't fit like I don't know so and I think like in general a lot of the tastes um a lot of the points of conversation like what cultural things cultural mm -hmm. norms that people can connect on like I couldn't go to my colleague and be like oh did you hear what happened to vibes oh you know what I mean like all the things <laughs> sure. that I can't do because the culture is such that it is not mm -hmm. um for black Jamaican sure woman, you know um and sure, it's very sure. much still structured to to make white upper class people feel comfortable um so yeah yeah no that those are great points it's it's it comes in it comes in waves right it comes at different instances so um in terms of the social social uh gatherings or um wine and cheese like i'm i'm uh 
lactose sensitive. So that's not even a thing that <laughs> really uh, I would have done uh, prior to prior to grad school. Um, I mean, I definitely do now, but but de- definitely I can see how that might have been disorienting for for um, for someone who looks like us. So so thank you for for bringing that up. Um, so just transitioning into um, this kind of gray area in terms of um, challenges and, and, and blackness in academia. Um, and this is a bit of a challenging question, but uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Kayon, because I think you've, you've all thought a lot about this, but you, you lead quite well into this question. Um, do you think your identity as a black woman has had uh, any impact on your academic success or trajectory through grad school? Um, why or why not? Yeah, I think that it has. Um, I think that my identity as a Black woman, as I kind of referred to in the last question, gives me, like, it makes me more intellectually creative, I think. Like, the way that I think about the world, the way that I approach my analysis, the types of questions that I ask, that, like, that have been informed by my lived experience as a Black woman, I think benefits my scholarship immensely. The type of work that I want to do, how I disseminate my research, I think has positively influenced um, my, my scholarship and, like, my academic but I will say that uh, racism has negatively impacted my uh, experience sure. and sexism has negatively impacted my experience and massage noir has negatively impacted my experience in, in many ways. Um, obviously, like being I'm a first generation student, so navigating the academy um, from as being the first person in my family to go to university was a lot. Um, and I think that's why it took me so long to finish my undergrad, because there's just so many things and maybe we'll get to this a little bit later on that you don't know or you're not explicitly taught to how to successfully navigate the academy these things that you're expected to know to navigate it well but Mm -hmm. aren't taught right Mm -hmm. and some people know it because they have parents and friends who go to university but when you're the first in your family to do it you kind of have to figure out all this stuff on your own um so I took seven years to finish my undergrad so certainly my career trajectory is very non-linear I non-linear I think I benefited from that in many ways um but that was uh, um, certainly something that shaped my trajectory. Also, like the microaggressions that you experience almost on a daily basis, like it gets at you and the sure. distracting. I think it was Audre Lorde who said that like one of the functions of racism is that it's a distraction, like it distracts right. you from doing the work that you want to do. So having these things influence me every day and having to deal with a professor who said a racist comment and trying to get more black people in grad school, like all of these things that are systemic failures fall on us as black mm-hmm. people. Um, and so we have to, to deal with that as we go through, as, as we go through grad school. So I think, um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely touched on a lot of points, important points. Thank you for that, Can. Um, Melanie, Tiffany, thoughts about being a black lady in uh, the academy. How has, how has this shaped your, your experiences? How has this shaped your scholarship? Either of you can, can jump in. Oh, I guess I'll go. So, um, <laughs> I love all of the positivity, Kaya. I love that. I was thinking of this question and I, and I couldn't think of very many positive things. Um, and I'll just say this for myself because I don't want it to, I don't want to make it seem like all black women struggle with low self-esteem. This is just my own personal response. So just take it as, as an individual. I think for me, it's been very challenging because I'd never believed that it was possible. Mm-hmm. And I think if you read stuff about the importance of role modeling in academia, like the, the impact that racism has on self-esteem. I just feel like I've been living in a society for so long where the standards are so low for black people. And I just haven't thought that this, this could actually be a thing. So a lot of the struggle for me has really been an internal kind of yep. struggle of, can I do this? Like I, I had to take four exams, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. Every single exam came with its own set of like, internal challenges because I, I really didn't believe that it was possible and I feel like this is why it's taking me so long because at every single point I have to struggle with that internal sense that I can't do it and and I don't know why I talk to my best friend about this all the time she's like Tiffany you graduated you do that you've done well why are you so um unsure of yourself but I do think that that has something to do with racism um but I don't know this is just me and the second point that's more general has to do with service and I'll go through this very quickly um the way that I've approached grad school is that I do have to have a, a connection to the community where, where I'm at. So that's meant that in Halifax, I've gotten involved in different um, projects just because I'm passionate about it, but I, it also brings me closer to Black people, <laughs> which yes. I want to have community. Sure. So that means that I've been doing a lot of things outside of my program that has slowed down my progress, and that's not what's required. What's required in academia is to pass your exams, 
pass your courses, defend your proposal, publish, and teach a couple courses. That's what my program requires. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing all this extra stuff because I want to, and, and it fuels me, and mm -hmm. that's slowing me down, right? Um, and I think that does have to do with my identity as a Black woman, but again, that's just my personal experience, so. Absolutely. No, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're speaking to to part of what I find many, many community members, myself included, um, deal with and, and kind of what uh, Canon touched on in terms of um, how things sometimes fall to us. I mean, for you, I know that connection to community is it feeds your soul and it's healing. And, and I say uh, I, I feel the same, um, but oftentimes I get involved in advocacy because I feel like there's no one else to do it. And if I don't do it, then how's it going to get done? And that that does also impact my my ability to do my work. So it's it's a double-edged sword. I love doing community work. I, it's important, but it's also, um, I feel in some ways, uh, obligatory. And, and you know, that's uh, as maybe uh, how Kayon had put it, part of the, the distraction. So um, complicated gray area here, but but that's what we're here to, to talk about. So so we'll, we'll end this question with Melanie. Yeah, all great, um, great things that are unmentioned. And I'll just echo um, most of the like similar um, thing. I think I've always been interested in science. So in terms of my like trajectory I, it, uh, of what I wanted to study, that's always been, I mean, a relatively clear path. I knew I wanted to be in science, but as a black woman, I think it definitely shaped my my service and everything that I do were related to mentorship. I um, I understand the importance of, of mentorship and, and for, for the black community and for first generation um, uh, students. And uh, I'm a first generation student myself and I really owe it to my sister actually, who's watching this, I believe, uh, for, hey. for, uh, hey. <laughs> everything, um, <laughs> for um, really guiding me through the application process of even getting into undergraduate school. So that is, uh, it's very challenging um, to start. And so, uh, yeah really through yes. really shape my mentorship definitely great yeah no this is uh, it, uh these these conversations i i, I honestly I, I really do appreciate them and i and i'm hoping our audience appreciates them as well because it, it it is complicated right it is complicated it's and it's not necessarily black and white but these are things that um black graduates students black uh, scholars are dealing with on the daily. And it's important to have these conversations to, to make our system more uh, aware and, and on the way to making it more equitable. Um, so we'll just transition here into the, to the last segment. Before we do, um, I'm wondering if Ian can pull up the next poll question. Um, hi, Ian. I see you're hi, unmuted. Absolutely. Uh, that'll be poll number two. And yes, I'll please. Launch that right now. Thank you. So um, the poll question is, what is most important to affecting policy on equity, inclusion, and anti-Black racism on campus? Just give me an idea of what people think. Um, and this is related to the next se segment. So we've talked about the good, we've talked about the bad-ish, and now we're moving into the future. So um, all of these, these wonderful panelists, these wonderful women are, are huge thinkers, great thinkers, and um, our experiences shape the way that we approach things, the way that uh, we hope things will will change for ourselves and for for um, incoming Black students, but also for the system. So I'm, I'm hoping that the next segment of this discussion will will get to that. Uh, we're looking at the results here. So the options were personal stories and conversations, allyship, community building, petitioning, administration, and data collection. And we have data collection in the first it is in running. What, what am I saying? It has the, the biggest response, 41 <laughs> percent. Um, and then allyship community building uh, shortly, shortly uh, leading behind. And there's personal stories and petitioning administration are tied. So that's that's interesting. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for taking that poll question. And we'll get right into these last set of questions here. Um, just general big, big question for for all of you panelists here. Um, what do you think? Um, institutions can do to um, be more uh, accepting of, of differences between people, specifically um, what can they do to be more inviting and supportive of, of Black scholars. So I'm going to start with Melanie. Okay. Um, so I sit on the diversity um, inclusion committee uh, in our radiology department, UCSF, and we talk about 
uh, these, these types of questions all the time of how we can um, put, put more policy in place, for example, or training um, more discussions. Um, so I'll, I'll just mention some of the things that we've been doing in our department. So we've started doing uh, what we call URM community dinners. These are dinners for underrepresented minorities in the department. And they give us all the DoorDash credit and we have a nice yes. informal discussion and just free food. And talk about how we're feeling. Yeah, free food. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and so that's been really, really nice. And um, and um, we, we also have a, a more formal training um, that is actually required of all faculty uh, at the institution to talk about inclusion um, and, and read more resource sharing and things like that for their for their students. Um, uh, and so I think those are those are kind of more policy related things that we've um, uh, included and uh, and I'm actually on planning uh, our radiology retreat right now and we we're talking about having a diversity and inclusion session um, that involves both both black um, and white plan panelists um, having mm -hmm. discussions from both perspectives about what they think the issues of diversity and inclusion are in the department and how we can address them. So I think also having discussions that are not just inclu including only um, certain groups of individuals, but everyone to get other people, everyone's perspectives on how we can move forward um, and be more inclusive of everyone. So. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Melanie. It sounds some sounds like some some great initiatives you guys are doing in, in radiology there at UCSF. Um, turn it over to to Kayon. What you thinking? What are what should our universities be doing? Yeah. A lot of things. A lot of things, girl. A lot oh, of man, things. A lot of things. They need to be, <laughs> let me say they need to be giving Black students more money. Sure. Um, especially grad students more <laughs> funding to support our research. Our research is important and it's undervalued. So we need to be getting more scholarships. We need to be getting more uh, better funding packages. At UBC, there is no scholarships for or funding or extra funding for Black graduate students who are mm -hmm. in, in the school. And I think that like we know that Black people are, you know, the ways that race and class intersect mm -hmm. and are inextricably linked under a system of racial capitalism means that a lot of Black people are coming from working class backgrounds. So how are you going to better support Black students when they come mm -hmm. into your program? Give them more money. Sure. Um, but in terms of other policy or, or things that institutions can do to be more um, supportive of Black students, I think that people in leadership positions, um, whether that's like higher administrative leadership positions or just faculty members, they need to understand that like their positions, their decisions are not neutral. Like they need to understand that they are, they're, the way that they see the world, the decisions that they make um, reflect how, like reflect their experiences of and because our experiences are informed by systems of racism sexism like unless you're really critically interrogating how you're not reproducing it you're reproducing it right sure. so the norm the status quo is to reproduce it so i think that people need to be a lot more reflexive of how their decisions are actively keeping some people out of the institution and um and making the institution a hostile and uncomfortable environment for people specifically specifically gra black graduate students um so yeah Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Reflection and and the I think there's a phrase that I'm probably going to misquote because I I do that sometimes. But it, in order to be, if it's not that you're not racist, you have to be actively anti-racist. So you have to challenge yourself to look from this lens of, okay, I am who I am, and I have my experiences, and how how does race play into these decisions? So so absolutely, I think that that's a an important point. If I can just add something. Yes, here. add all the things. Um, that I think because of the way that we understand racism, white people like to remove themselves from it. They like to think mm -hmm. that they're not implicated in those systems at all. But like when we understand that all of these systems of inequality, people benefit from them, right? Like right. I benefit from heteronormativity as being a heterosexual woman. I don't want it to continue. Like I'm going to actively take a stance against it and try to challenge it, but I, I'm still complicit in those systems, right? Mm -hmm. So white people need to begin to implicate themselves in that system mm -hmm. and realize that like they are they are complicit and they have a role in perpetuating it. They can't just say, you know, because as you were saying, what, whatever the quote was, like, I know, <laughs> you're, being racist, you're being racist. Like, yeah, yeah. And in the same way, unless I'm being actively against heteronormativity, unless I'm being actively against transphobia, I'm perpetuating it. I'm complicit in those systems. So mm -hmm. um, I think people in positions of privilege, whatever position of privilege you occupy, sure. you need to understand that you're complicit in them, whether you like it or not. And you benefit Definitely. from it, whether you like it or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Um, I think Tiffany's left. 
Yeah, so when I thought about this question, I actually thought about at the level of the professor and the teachers. Sure. And uh, two things came to mind. So first, addressing your curriculum. Um, I was a very angry undergrad student and slightly less angry master's student, and now I'm kind of chill and mellow. But I realized that I was so angry because I was starving for like black work, feminist work in philosophy, people of color, non-white people. I was just starving for different perspectives. Sure. And in my field, it's been such a challenge to get traditional areas like metaphysics, epistemology to really take seriously thinkers of color, contemporary work. So I would say if you are an instructor, take a look at your syllabus and see if you can update yourself on what other types of people are writing about your field, even if it's critical work, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a critical look at all of the things in your canon sure. that have been worshipped, that would be sure. amazing. And then second, at the level of the instructor, teacher support for your students of color or for your Black students. So if you see that a Black student is struggling, um, maybe reach out and ask why. And that could be something that actually saves them from failing a course or dropping out or flunking out because they may not feel comfortable coming to you because you all look different. There's all this stuff about racism. So you as an individual can actively help at the level of what you do as a teacher and a professor to help to retain students um, and make it so that they want to come to become undergrad students and then eventually get to the point of being a professor, right? It, you, have to, you have to keep students throughout the process. Yeah, and if students retention. Are dropping out, they're not going to become academics. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You speak to an important point about retention and, and um, that, that ties into uh, this next question about, about race-based data collection. So as we saw in our poll question, um, many of us in the room think that that is um, part of the solution to, to getting our, our institutions, our academic institutions to being more, more equitable. And so uh, this question for you ladies is, um, do you believe that race-based data uh, should be collected? Um, why or why not? Um, and Tiffany, I still see your, your face on my screen. So I'm just gonna ask you to, to respond to that question. Yes, I think it's absolutely necessary at this point. Mm -hmm. There is no excuse. We need to know who it is. And if people don't want to self-identify, I would just say, assume that they're white. <laughs> All I right. Find it. Allow sure. people to not identify on sure. this stuff, but at least ask the questions so that we Definitely. can get some kind of information, so for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Melanie, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, at UCSF, we're collecting these data. We collect it for the institution and we, we divide it based on whether they're a trainee or whether they're faculty or whether they're staff. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are quite alarming um, when you look at the number of, of black representation and in institutions. And that was actually something that really sparked more of my interest in diving into, into um, these numbers and, and trying to understand, uh, you know, like where where are these numbers coming from? How many people are applying how, for jobs and how many people are actually getting into the institutions? Um, and, and we just talked about this last week in our, uh, or this week in our diversity and inclusion committee regarding the matching program for residency and how many of those people who interviewed were black and how many got into the program that were black. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's important. Right. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, the the U.S. I know you're you're Canadian, but you've you've now migrated to the U.S. for for many years, and so honorary American. But the the Americans definitely collect this data. The U.S. collects this data, and so at least you know they are able um, to to critically assess what is going on. And I, and so, yeah, I appreciate that point, Melanie. Can send us off on this question. Your yeah, thoughts? Girl. Yeah, we definitely need to be collecting um, race-based data, but I will um, say a little caveat to that. So Tracy, sure. who is a sociologist, um, she says that most of our problems aren't of empirical limitations, but they're okay. problems of political will. So it's not that even if we have the data, mm. it requires political will to do something to change what sure. the data are showing, right? Um, and so Ruha Benjamin, who's another sociologist, big up the black sociologist, um, <laughs> she, I think she coined this uh, term, um, the datification of oppression. So this idea that we're collecting mm. all of the data, but nothing is still being done, right? So we can't be collecting data for the sake of collecting data if there isn't the political will to change what the data is showing, right? I Absolutely. think a lot of people know anecdotally that black people are underrepresented. Like we're having these conversations, although there's no race-based data to just yeah. those claims, we know, but even when that data is collected and it should be collected, we need the political will and the organizing to ensure that something is being done about it because just collecting data isn't going to solve anything. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for, for bringing that point. It's definitely a very relevant point. And so uh, we hope, I hope 
uh, that as our institutions are starting to, to do this, that that the momentum continues. That's always been been my fear, and I and I think for for many Black people, where we're in this moment of uh, hyper awareness of of the the Black experience, or, or wanting to at least hear what that is, and so um, let's hope that it's not a mo moment, and that it is a, a movement, and that once we start going and getting this data, that something is done. Hopefully, the political will is sustained. So, very relevant point, uh, Kayon. Wow, it's already been like an hour and 10 minutes, like this has been great. This has been really, really great. And and we're gonna get to our, our questions and answers shortly. Um, before we do that, I wanna end off on um, a question. Um, so you can answer either one of the two questions. So so pick, uh, pick your poison. So you can either answer, <laughs> what advice would you give to incoming students or perhaps related to that, what do you know now about, about academia um, that you didn't know earlier in your graduate experience and, um, and in terms of what you would share with, with a, a new student uh, or incoming uh, uh, black student? So those are two questions that are kind of related. Um, I'm going to start with Melanie. Okay, I always say this and I will always continue saying this. I'm a huge fan of cold emailing. It's how I got to where I am in my career right now. Um, I don't think it's always, I, I think connection is important and having uh, a connection helps, but um, you'd be surprised how far a cold email can go. Um, when I've applied to anything, um, I always track down the email of the person and send a polite email, just you know, expressing my interest in the research or the opportunity. Um, and, and actually getting to UCSF, was a matter of someone just telling me, oh, they have a great program for brain tumor research. And then me cold emailing someone who was definitely the wrong person to email, but then connected me to the correct person that right. eventually allowed me to get a, uh, obtain a postdoc position. So I think just um, having confidence and believing that you have something important to bring to the table and that uh, your contributions are, you know, are valued and uh, just putting yourself out there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, how about you, Ken? What do you think? Yeah, um, I think I would answer both of those questions. Sure, first. please do. <laughs> but think, but with one answer. Okay, by fine. Saying that, um, finding community and finding mentors is like so important. I have benefited so much um, from mentorship and from people really believing in me and supporting me and like pouring into me. Um, I definitely wouldn't be where I am right now if not for the mentors who have really supported me throughout. And then also like finding your people, your community, people who love on you and care about you and, and want to see you see you do well um, to kind of like fuel to fuel yourself and to feel happy because grad school can be very stressful and isolating. Um, so certainly having your community there is very important. And can you before I go to Tiffany, can you talk about um, this hidden curriculum? If you could, you brought that up previously, yeah. and, and I think that that's a, an important point to to hopefully talk about uh, now. Yeah, um, so hidden curriculum is basically the things that you're expected to know in grad school to succeed in grad school, but you aren't explicitly taught. So things like even how to send a cold email, things mm -hmm. like how to choose an advisor, things like, um, I don't know, like how to, like all of these terms and jargon that's used in the academy that people, unless you have other networks that have gone to the academy, you don't know how to, mm -hmm. how to fun not how to function, but it's harder for you to pick up on those things. Um, so. Yeah, that's very important. There's actually a book uh, written by Jess Calarco. She's a sociologist, but she wrote this book called The Field Guide to Grad School, Uncovering mm. the Thin Curriculum. I'm currently reading it right now as I prepare for my PhD, but yes. like that book, I think what I've read so far, it really um, outlines some of the things that they don't teach you in grad school that you need to know in order to, to really do well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And when you brought that up um, in our in our initial conversation, and I was like, yeah, that is a hundred percent a thing. It's like an unnamed thing. Like you know, it's a thing, but you you don't know how to describe it. And so, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and it's not only helpful for for black uh, incoming black uh, students, but for for all any all and any person who is thinking about going into to graduate school. It's definitely something that I think should be should be uh, reviewed. And so I'll end with Tiffany. Sure, so I think my comments basically echo Kayon's about um, finding mentors, finding role models. 
uh, because what's going to get you through the process is people who support you. And for me, support has come in the form of white professors, black professors, professors of color. Like I've had support across the board from many different kinds of people, but I definitely couldn't have gotten to this point without having those people. So they are very important. Um, and I just want to share a quick story. Yes, um, please. Current, my current supervisor, um, I found out about him in my undergrad. I was ranting to one of my professors about where are all the black philosophers tell me. And he said, well, actually there's one who was one of my students who's now a Dalhousie. So, so I ended up looking him up and seeing that he did philosophy of race. So I was like, okay, so there's one. And then from there I was able to reach out to him and find other people. But just asking those questions ended up opening something for me that wouldn't have been open if I wasn't willing to ask. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and have have relationships with your professors. They they are really supportive, many of them. So that would be my advice to, to incoming students. Don't absolutely. be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yes, absolutely. What a nice way to, to end off this this uh, this segment. You guys have been great and you're not off the hook yet. We're going to transition uh, now into our question and answer segment with the audience. So I'm just going to see if there are questions in the chat. Just give me a moment here because I have not been following. Um, is this a question? Yes. So this is from Medina. She says, hi, everyone. Thank you for your discussion. Uh, it is so nice to hear your experiences and that others are not alone in these feelings. I'm wondering if you can discuss any feelings of discouragement or almost learned helplessness of not knowing how to navigate uh, situations in academia and feeling like giving up or being frustrated with not knowing how to engage what is uh, how to engage what is punishable and what isn't, how to know how to exceed and succeed in academia and what can be accepted in journals and articles, etc. So for me, I find that there are so many rules that are unwritten. Hey, Medina. I was just talking about this. There's so many rules that are unwritten and un unstated, and there's so much non-explicit knowledge to learn and entering the field uh, wanting to succeed and not knowing anything about these systems is difficult. Medina, yes, we feel you. Okay, so <laughs> Kian has her book, so I can't, I can't not start off with her, obviously. So please go ahead, Kian. I was just I was just referring to the book so folks know or can see yes, what of it course. is. It's a really helpful guide, I think, Medina, if you're interested or like wanting to like learn more of these unspoken rules that you're supposed to know but aren't but don't but aren't taught. Uh, a there we go. at school by Jess Calarco is is really a really great resource. Awesome. Yeah, no, definitely. And and you uh, spoke to that a little bit, the the hidden curricul curriculum. So hopefully we touched on that. Um, Tiffany or Melanie, did you want to jump in? Uh, I know we we sort of covered this, but maybe you had some things to add and if not we can, we can move on um I'll say that a lot of these things I learned slowly over the process of of graduate uh, school um primarily from my mentor but I know that's not the case where everyone has a mentor that they can learn these things from so I might suggest finding um often people have multiple mentors uh, if you have a one person that's your um, main principal investigator or boss. Um, it's not completely unnormal to have another person that you can ping questions to and ask these things. Um, I also like to read books. I'm currently reading a book on grant writing because um, that I often find a lot of the structure, it's, it's hard to learn when, by someone providing you, for example, an example of a manuscript or an example of a, mm -hmm. a grant and you trying to copy that, that structure. So often these, these literature that are written or sometimes they're actually articles on how to write an article um, are, are quite useful, I find. Um, but yeah, I'll just stop Thank there. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tiffany? Yeah, so just to add to that briefly, um, my best friend works in government and she has, she taught me about this thing called information interviews where you just meet with people who you would like to have a career trajectory like and you talk to them about what that would mean. And it, to me, to get the best information would be to go to the source. So I would say go to a professor that you're comfortable with and start asking these questions and having these conversations. And usually they are willing to give you that kind of advice. And if you can't find it the first time, find someone that you connect with and then, of course, all the other resources like books and Google are there as well. But I find discipline specific advice usually comes straight from the horse's mouth. So that would be yeah. my response. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great advice, you guys. Um, so uh, we're ramping down here. I'm just wondering if there was any questions. We'll give the audience um, some time here. And you can actually 
uh, if you want, I can uh, have Ian unmute you if you want to actually uh, say your question. There, Evelyn, I don't know if you noticed, but there's 10 questions in the Q and A. Oh, so, I don't know how to, oh, I don't know how to use things. I'm very uh, bad okay. at the internet. No worries, so you, uh, <laughs> Medina actually posted a question there. So you got to that question. Okay, you, that's you, good. Have, have there, and yes, can, I can see that now. Okay, okay. thank you, Ian. Yeah, I uh, still learning technology. You would think after all the years of grad school, I'd know things. Okay, so the next question we have here is, um, um, so this was upvoted, sorry. Um, have you ever felt uncomfortable affirming or marking your identity as a Black woman on applications for grad programs or scholarships? I sometimes hesitated because of not wanting to be a, to be part of a department that only wants me there to fill quotas of some kind without actually appreciating my sk skills and contributions. But at the same time, uh, or I just missed that. But at the same time, I feel that we should be taking advantage of whatever small institutional benefits we can get. Curious to hear your thoughts. Anybody, anybody? <laughs> I'll go. Yes. I was actually just talking to this, talking about this to my other grad students today. Look, I will check every box that will get me a job, okay? Girl, Black, same. Woman, Girl, same. Um, Girl, same. <laughs> I'm also an immigrant. I can just make, look, all of the boxes I'm checking to get a job. Yes. So I would say be shameless. <laughs> it's an era where people actually care, you know, and maybe 10 or 15 years ago it may have been a disadvantage hopefully today it's something that might get you in the door and honestly my own view if my identity is what gets me in the door i'm fine with showing up and and rocking whatever i have to rock right like i'm, I'm confident in my ability so i would say go ahead check all the boxes and see what happens yeah yeah definitely i i uh, can i add that yes I definitely feel like I understand where the the maybe the comment is coming from that sometimes it can feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I I feel like there's this exhaustion with my with my PI and I because I'm Canadian and uh, underrepresented minority and that is two hits against me that make it more difficult for me to even succeed in my field. And so I kind of feel really exhausted often when I'm getting emails forwarded by her that are, uh, you know, oh, opportunity for URM, opportunity for URM, opportunity for URM. But then to also echo Tiffany's point, I think if it's available to you, it's going to help you get through, um, take advantage of it. So, um, but I definitely understand. And yeah, sometimes it does feel frustrating because I just want to do good science. And why can't I just compete with other people in the same pool uh, as everyone else? Okay, you good? Yeah, I'm great. I think you both answered. Perfect. Thank you for that question, Rachel. And I apologize to everybody again. I, I'm just figuring out, figuring things out. So we're going to move on to this next question. Um, do you feel that there were any challenges to your success as a student facing these racial differences? So um, I think we on that. Yeah, we probably did. Uh, sorry. Okay, so we'll, we'll just skip on here. Okay, thank you for all your time. Are there any seemingly innocuous behaviors performed by non-Black colle colleagues that you notice which negatively impact your experience? I think or hope that the more egregious behaviors are more likely to be resisted by friends or bystanders, but less explicit behaviors may go unnoticed by those without this lived experience. So does anything stick out in your mind uh, with respect to you? Uh, was, I guess I guess really it's getting to um, almost like a microaggressions. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants to, to speak on that. Yeah, um, yeah, I think as you're saying, Eve, it's really like the everyday thing that like is very even hard to like come up with like concrete examples, examples of stuff. Um, I will say for me though, Tiffany's point about the syllabus is really important. I think that's one thing that non-black colleagues uh, and black colleagues do this as well do to make experiences harder um, when you're disqualifying black scholars as knowers and like really downplaying our intellectual contributions that makes an isolating experience for a lot of black grad students like when i look at the syllabus and i don't see myself reflected in it or like any type of black ways of knowing caribbean ways of knowing i feel isolated and it makes my experience in grad school negative so um that's probably one way i can i can think of that is like persistent um, throughout my grad mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Can. 
Um, I think that we'll keep moving along here. If, if Melanie or Tiffany don't want to jump in, we good with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have a question for, um, I think this is for Melanie. Um, yes, I skipped one, but I'll go back to it. Um, this person, Alero, is a first year postdoctoral candidate in earth sciences. Um, and they say the concern about identifying the niche distinct from supervisor's interest has been uh, a struggle for this person and been on their mind these days. What helped you in your journey to finding and sticking to your current specific research interest? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I definitely think having conversations with um, people in your institution, um, attending different talks, um, and and connecting with people. So I um, I actually found this particular area of research when I was trying to leave academia because I was quite that level of discouraged, and had a an, an, a breakfast uh, conversation with the founder of a startup. And his company was interested in deep brain stimulation and he name dropped some people and that actually led me back into academia <laughs> when I was trying to leave like this net that was like was not letting me leave. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you, you can find inspiration in the most bizarre places that you wouldn't think even when you're trying to leave bringing you back. So I just, um, I would recommend um, being, keep being open minded and being open to all possible opportunities, um, people that you wouldn't think of, even outside of earth sciences, there are collaborations that you can do that connect two different fields. So I think just being open-minded and um, exposing yourself to other areas of research that connect with yours um, is a good strategy. Um, it, it seems like often sometimes you might have, you might think you have to stay within the area that you're in and then kind of do something only slightly different from your your um, PI. But in my case, for example, I just took my imaging expertise and I went to a completely different patient population and a completely different therapy, but still held true some of the things that are important to me and some of my skills and my expertise. So um, I'm definitely, I'm always happy to chat one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So um, I'm not sure maybe, um, Eve will have our emails and stuff available. Sure. I'd love to have a one-on-one -on -one chat if you're interested or anyone for mentorship purposes. So absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for no that problem. question. Um, so we're, we're in the last few minutes here. So I'm just going to read one question and I think pose a question before we end here. So um, this question talks about um, mentorship, which we have touched on here today. And it says, do you find yourself looking for black academic mentors during grad school? This person found themselves seeking out minority or black mentors in academia, but found it challenging if they didn't have similar areas of re, uh, research or interests. And um, the question is, did you uh, panelists find yourselves able to find suitable mentors that identified as Black? And that was, um, would you speak about that? I, I will just start here and say that um, I have not had any uh, Black mentors in, in my experience, but I have had mentors who have been uh, white and uh, um, other people of color and have been quite supportive. So um, I'm not sure if uh, I'll, I'll allow either can or Tiffany to, to respond to this question um, briefly. I don't know if I'm officially anyone's mentee. <laughs> I don't <laughs> sure. know if that's a conversation you used to have with someone. And say, <laughs> right. I don't I don't think I've had a conversation to solidify that relationship. I've had black professors, not even in my field, it's been great. Um, and other professors as well. So so yes, I guess I would say I don't have an official mentor, but I do have a lot of people that I draw from mm -hmm. yeah. who, are, who are Black and non-Black. Definitely. So my... Yeah, and I think this speaks to the question of what men what a mentor looks like. And I think that they can look uh, a bunch of different ways and can be um, useful in various aspects of our lives, not just with research, can be great for um, personal development and, and um, even just somebody to check on you and make sure that you're okay. Um, so mentorship will be one of the conversations we'll be having in our upcoming episode. And so uh, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, and um, basically start to wrap up here. So um, right, Ian has posted in the chat, the episode two of our series will be on Wednesday, April 28th from 3 to 4.30 Eastern. Uh, hopefully you all can join. And there's just a couple of things that people have posted here, which I think are interesting. Uh, Brittany Morrison, so I think this is Melanie's sister. Uh, the Globe and Mail recently published an investigative 
um, series, The Power Gap, they reported that women are outnumbered by their male counterparts in academia and that women send concentrated lower level academic positions. The Globe and Mail analyzed the top one percentile of earners. Oops. And oh, there's a poll question while I wrap this up. <laughs> the, oh, the, sorry. That's okay. No problem. I'll, I'll, it's, it's fine. People can do to do do two things at once, but essentially um, the end of this just says the Global Mail analyzed the top 1% of earners and um, of 82 Canadian universities of the 74 women in the category, only 10 were determined to be women of color. So I just thought that that was an interesting thing to read there. Um, and so, yeah, the last question, last poll question as you guys are exiting audience members is about uh, a segment that I'm thinking about adding to the show. Um, and if, if you were to join again, would you be interested in um, uh, petition the p petition a professor so we'd have a professor black professor or a researcher come in and, and talk about the the issue at hand uh, maybe it's the Canadian black fact of the day or more catchy the can black fact of the day would you want to hear about that um, the last one would might be mailed in messages or emails from people who might not have been able to join um, and and just get the the conversation moving so if you can answer that and we'll post uh, post those results pretty soon here. But um, yeah, I'm, oh, petition of professor. Okay, well, there we go. That I'm gonna try and find a way to incorporate that into the next, the next couple ep episodes. So this has been lovely. Thank you guys all so much for, for being here uh, with, with me today. Uh, specific thank yous to, to Melanie, uh, Tiffany and Kayon for their insightful uh, knowledge and just being so personal and open and honest. I also have to mention our sponsors, of course, the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies. Thank you guys all so much for, for attending today. Ian, did you have any last minute things to say? Uh, just a hearty congratulations to you, Evelyn, for your oh. first episode being complete. Yeah. Uh, I know how much work you put into this, uh, but perhaps yes. the audience doesn't, but Evelyn has been working <laughs> extremely hard to get this done. And I think we can all agree that this was a, a smashing success. So congrats to you, Eve. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much. And thank you panelists again for being here with me. Episode two, Good and Bad Black Rod, The Good and the Bad of Black Rod, uh, April 28th. So hopefully we'll see you all, all there. Thanks guys.